All right, next up we have the sense of vision. Now this one's going to be pretty exciting because we're looking at the structures, uh, the anatomy and physiology of the eye. Um, so the outermost layer of the eye is going to be made up of two parts called the sclera and the cornea. Does anybody know or take a moment, see if you can kind of describe the sclera. Yeah, the sclera is going to be the white part of the eye. That's that tough outer white region that ultimately provides the shape and protection to the eyeball. It's going to serve as the site for muscle attachment. So this is what allows you to look left and right and roll your eyes at all my wonderful sense of humor. Um, but not all of your eye is going to be covered in that sclera. So which part of the eye is not covered in that sclera, that dense, whiter outer portion? Yeah, that's going to be the cornea. The cornea is going to be the white, or not the white, I'm sorry. It's going to be the transparent front part of the eye. This is what allows light to enter and it allows us to see. So that's going to be the outer region of the eye. That's the sclera and the cornea. Um, and you're going to see that here. Well, actually, here. Here is our uh, eye. We have the sclera is the white part. That's going to be this entire sort of ball-shaped region. And then there's sort of like a hole in the sclera, um, which is going to be the cornea. So this is a clear part. It is, it, there's still coverage. It's not like a direct hole into your eye. There is a clear portion. That's going to be your cornea right here. This is what allows light to enter into your eye. All right, so this is um, going to be... There you go. That's that the, the outer region of the eye. Now, the middle layer of the eye is going to be the vascular layer. This is going to be the layer that provides nutrients and um, oxygen to the rest of the organ or to the rest of the eyeball. The middle layer is going to be comprised of three specific regions. The choroid, which contains the blood, blood vessels to supply chemicals, nutrients, oxygen to the tissues of the eye. This is also going to contain melanin, which absorbs any light reflected from the retina. So this kind of gives a dampening effect, and it allows us to have sharper, clearer focus. It prevents light from sort of, so that's our middle layer that we're talking about, the vascular layer. It's going to have melanin. This is going to prevent uh, light from coming into your eye and then just bouncing all around like a ping pong ball. Um, it's really going to just dampen all of the light except for that which, re which is going to reflect onto your retina in the back. Um, so we're going to, we'll talk about the retina in just a moment. Um, so it's going to dampen the eye. It's going to give us sharper focus and um, give us more, um, it's going to uh, absorb that excess light. Um, so that's going to be our choroid. So the next stop in from the choroid is going to be the ciliary body. Now the ciliary body is going to be a ring of muscle tissue that encircles the lens. This helps hold the lens in place and it also adjusts for focus. Does anybody know what is the purpose of the lens of the eye? So here is our um, ciliary body. That's going to be this muscle right here and right here. It's going to hold the lens, this is our lens right here. Does anybody know why we want to bend and uh, change the shape of the lens? It helps give us focus. This is what allows us to look closer or farther away. Um, this is going to allow us to focus on images at varying distances. So the lens is very important and be the ability to adjust that lens becomes important. Now over time, those um, cil that ciliary body, those muscles can weaken with age and um, the lens itself can lose its elasticity, making it harder to focus. This is why as you age, so many individuals eventually need reading glasses. It eventually need glasses to help them focus up close. It's because of the loss of the elasticity in the lens and the uh, strength of that ciliary muscle. Um, so that's going to be the lens. Now there is a similar piece of equipment on the compound light microscope that we use. It's also going to regulate the amount of light that, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead in my notes. Let me back up for just a moment. So that's going to be um, our lens and our ciliary body. Now moving forward from that, we also have an iris. The iris is going to be the muscular portion of the choroid layer that's found just in front of that ciliary body. So here's our ciliary body with our lens. Just in front of that, we have the iris. Um, the iris is going to be responsible for... Um, sorry, every time I switch pages, I jump forward and backward in my notes. Let me find where I'm talking about 
or iris. Okay. Yes. The iris is going to be that muscular part of the choroid that's found just in front of the ciliary body. Um, now it contains smooth muscle. So if it's smooth muscle, do we have control? Is it voluntary or involuntary control? Involuntary. Hopefully everybody got that. It's a smooth muscle that opens and closes to regulate the amount of light that is being allowed to enter your eye. So this allows your light, your pupils to dilate. When your pupils dilate, they widen, they open up. Um, this allows more light in. So you're going to see that your pupils dilate in uh, areas of low light. Your pupils contract in areas of bright light. Um, this ability to contract and dilate is very, very important, um, especially for things like just because um, I'm thinking of it right now. A great example of this would be nighttime driving. You want your pupils to dilate at night so that way you can um, so that way you can see uh, you can absorb any excess light of your surroundings and allow you to drive at night. The problem is, is you also want your uh, pupils to constrict very quickly when you have headlights coming at you. This is why it can be kind of painful when there's really bright light in your eyes because your um, your pupils need to contract. Now the problem is not only um, are your pupils going to constrict or contract um, when you have headlights coming at you, but it can sort of feel like it's temporarily blinding you. It's preventing you from focusing on anything around you because your pupils are becoming so restricted. Um, uh, just a, just a, an example of a homeostatic imbalance. Um, my husband had, um, he had uh, uh, retinoblastoma as a child. And so he had to have one of his eyes removed and the other eye um, had to be eventually frozen. The tumor in that eye had to be frozen. Now, the problem with this is when they froze the tumor, they also froze and damaged um, his pupil. So his pupil is permanently in a permanent state. It cannot dilate or contract. Um, so it's always the same size, um, which is fine for most of the time. Um, but he does struggle in really, really bright light. Um, so, you, you know, always, of course, wear sunglasses when he goes outside and it's really sunny um, because it can be painful, the amount of light that's coming into his eye. He also cannot drive at night um, because his eye cannot um, contract or dilate well enough. It's just sort of frozen in a permanent middle state. It cannot dilate or contract enough in order to see if there's no light coming and then also... Um, if there is light coming, headlights coming at him, it, it, it almost completely blinds him. So anyway, there you go. There is an example of a real life homeostatic imbalance and the significance of that pupil, the significance of being able to contract or dilate your pupil um, as needed. All right, last thing uh, I'm going to say about that before I move on. Um, there is a similar piece of equipment on the compound light microscope that we use that helps regulate the amount of light that passes through the specimen. Does anybody remember from your, um, your microscope lab, does anybody know or remember what that piece of equipment is called? It is also called the iris. The iris on your microscope works just like the iris of your eye. It's going to regulate the size of the pupil. The pupil is just that opening. It's just that hole. The iris is what constricts or uh, dilates to allow light in. All right, and that pupil is just going to be an opening at the center of the iris. It allows light to enter the eye and reach the retina. It dilates in dim light. It constricts in bright light, allowing, to reg allowing for you to regulate the amount of light that comes in. All right, so that's your eye. Here's the iris, the ciliary body wrapped around that lens that's going to control the shape of that lens. Um, and I do want to mention just a few more things about the um, about your eye, the structure of your eye. So the lens, like I said, is attached to the ciliary body by suspensory ligaments. So these are the ligaments that attach it to the ciliary body muscles. They're going to, and this region right here, the difference between sort of the front region and the back region as uh, divided out by the ciliary body, it's going to divide the eye into two compartments. The anterior compartment, that's going to be this region right up here. Uh, the anterior compartment is in front of the lens. The posterior compartment is behind the lens. The anterior compartment is filled with a clear watery fluid called the aqueous humor. Now that aqueous humor is continually produced and then drained by the tiny ducts. So this is going to um, drain that, that fluid out. Now a homeostatic imbalance associated with this aqueous humor would be glaucoma. Glaucoma, in the case of glaucoma, those drainage ducts right here are going to be, um, are going to be blocked. 
and the aqueous humor can build up. So when we have too much aqueous humor in the front of the eye, um, it can build up pressure. It's going to compress the arteries that serve the retina um, where the photoreceptors are located. Um, this can result in the gradual loss of vision leading to eventually total blindness. So um, this is why if you ever get your eyes checked, they always do a glaucoma test. They are testing the pressure in this region right here to make sure that you don't have a buildup of that aqueous humor. All right, so we've talked about the outermost and the middle layer. Now we're going to move into that third layer, the innermost layer of the eye. This is going to be the region, the retina. This is what's going to contain photoreceptors that respond to the light by generating electrical signals. They send the signals to the brain via the optic nerve. Now the photoreceptors, there are two different types of photoreceptors that we're going to use. Um, rods are going to be used for vision in dim light um, and also black and white vision. So they're going to give us sort of sharpness and focus and contrast. Cones are going to be responsible for color vision. Um, so the, so our, those are our rods and our cones. Those are photoreceptors. So we have, um, our color vision and sort of our black and white contrast vision. Um, also found within the retina is going to be a couple of different regions. So we're going to talk about uh, the fovea, the fovea centralis. This is going to be a region of the retina with the greatest concentration of cones. The objects are going to be focused here for sharp vision. This is why when you are wanting to focus on an object, you look directly at it. So if you see something out of your peripheral vision and you want to focus on it more specifically, you're going to turn your head and focus your vision on uh, that object. It's going to give you the greatest clarity and the greatest focus. Um, so the objects are going to be focused here for really sharp vision. Uh, the fovea centralis, so the very, very center of that fovea, is going to be packed with cone cells. Uh, so when you look directly at an object, when you face it and you look at it and you focus your eyes directly on it, it is going to be focused, that image is focused directly onto the fovea. Now the optic nerve is also found inside of this internal retina region. The optic nerve is going to be made of sensory fibers from the retina. This is going to take all of those nerve single signals to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. This is, however, if you look at the portion of the eyeball, this is our retina. Our retina is going to be this internal layer. Our optic nerve is going to be this region right here. This is also what's known as the blind spot because there are no photopigments in this area right here. All right, so I do want to recommend that you spend just a little bit of time with this diagram. Uh, I'm sorry, not this diagram, this chart. Um, this is going to give you an overview of the different structures of the eye and their function. Um, I'm not going to expect you to go into too much more depth than this. So this would be a really great place to make yourself flashcards or use the chart, whatever, whatever tools you use to help you study and prepare. Um, I strongly recommend flashcards because personally that what's what's that is what works best for me. So what I, I what I would do if I was studying for this course is I would make a flashcard with a picture on the front, a picture and an arrow, and um, then on the back would be what the structure is, the the name of the structure and its function. So personally, that's just that's how I would study um, because that's what you're going to want to know. You're going to want to be able to identify these regions on site. It'll be helpful for you in our labs. It'll be helpful for you going forward and taking that main physiology class. Um, it's going to be helpful for you in doing your homework assignments. So you're going to want to be able to look at a diagram and identify all of the different regions and their functions. So there you go. That's my little plug for that chart. Uh, but moving on, we are not quite finished talking about the eye. We're going to talk just a little bit more about some of the different regions. So we're going to focus just a little bit on the function of the lens. Like I said before, that lens is responsible for helping us focus, helping us see close up or far away. Um, so the, the cornea lens and humerus are going to help focus images onto the retina. Now the light rays are going to be bent when they're brought into focus, and the image on the retina is actually inverted and reversed left to right. Um, so it's so your brain actually reinterprets that image. So let me just show you this real quick. So the light rays are going to uh, pass through the lens and they're going to bounce on the onto the back of the retina. Now here's the interesting thing. This image, as you can see, light rays from up here are going to come in and be projected down here. Light rays from down here are going to be projected up here. Uh, same versus left versus left and right. Um, so we're going to actually see an inversion and a reversion of um, this image. This image gets sent to your brain upside down and backwards. However, your brain then interprets it correctly, flips that image around. 
Now we're going to pause just right here for a moment um, and we'll pick up in our next video talking more about the focus of that light um, on the retina of the eye.